Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer because listen, we don't come to hear from a man. Don't come to hear from a woman. Don't ever come. Listen, listen. Don't ever come to hear from a guy or from a, from a woman. All right, men have nothing to say. Really, the truth is we come to hear from the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge Jesus Christ is our senior pastor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and speak to us today through me. And, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you through your ears. So today, if you're able to stand, would you join me in prayer as we go before the Lord in prayer? Father, we just come before you. And Lord, we're grateful. Oh, what a night to come to, to church, Lord. What a night to be in the presence of God. Oh, Lord, we're just so grateful that we're here tonight and we don't take it for granted. Lord, whether we came to church for, for the wrong reasons or the right reasons, we're here today. Lord, we thank you that we come into this place not for a man or for a woman, but to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that your son, Jesus Christ, is the senior pastor of this church. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, would be our counselor, would be our guidance today, Lord. I thank you that you would show us the word of God, that it would be like a seed planted into our hearts, into our lives, Lord. We would walk away bearing much fruit for the glory in the kingdom of God. And Lord, we thank you for all of the blessings that you've given to us. Lord, we don't ask these blessings upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, we never think of ourselves as better than, uh, better than anybody else, but rather we are truly co-laborers in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for all our brothers and sisters all across the world. Lord, may you lift them up, strengthen them, encourage them. And, Lord, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen. amen. Well, praise God. I'll tell you what, I'm excited for tonight. Kind of a, kind of a, a story night. I get to share some stories, uh, uh, some, some experiences. And tonight, the, the title of the message is this, Focus Realignment. If you're taking notes or preparing to take notes. A Focus Realignment. Now, the reason I say that, I remember just thinking of it. I remember there was a time when we were filming. Uh, uh, we used to film um, for the International School of Ministry classes here at, at the church, and we would set up all of our cameras. And I remember one time, one of our friends, one of the guys that uh, used to work at the church, he tripped on a cable, and he pulled a camera off these really big uh, uh, stage pieces. They're real tall, and he pulled it. I mean, I remember what happened in, in slow motion. You know, as the tech guy, I used to be the tech guy at the church. I remember watching this camera, this big studio camera, just kind of uh, fall from like eight feet. And it took all of the fall on those big TV lenses. And I remember everything worked. It was amazing. It was like God's hand was on there like the pillow of, uh, of God's mercy on the Rock Church and World Outreach Center caught the camera. The only thing that happened is, is a little piece of glass on the inside of the lens got out of alignment. But that simple alignment issue with just one piece of glass out of many pieces of glass made it so that the camera wouldn't see clearly, that it was blurry on one side, and that it just didn't work the right way. And so what we had to do is we had to send that lens in and they had to take it apart and they had to put all the pieces right back together so that as you look through it, everything came into alignment. Today I want to talk about focus realignment, not about cameras, not about lenses. You're like, Pastor Luke, what? Are we going to have a, a technology lecture? No, 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 no. That's for another time. But tonight I want to talk about our focus. You see, when you and I focus on something, it becomes transparent. It becomes clear. Uh, is anybody in there in the, in, in the house tonight, is anybody like a researcher? You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're going to buy something, whether it be a car or maybe just jeans, whatever it might be, like you got to get in there. You got to know like, all right, who's got the best this or who's got... Who's got the best safety pick over here? Is, is, there any, is there any researchers in the house today? Look at you guys. With this information age, it, it becomes so easy to become information overloaded. I know for me, whenever it comes time to, to look into something, my wife's probably right now, she's at home with the kids watching online, and she's, she's rolling her eyes thinking, oh, is he telling the truth or is he telling the truth? When it comes time for me to get something or buy something, when the, when the window's open, oh, man, I go into research mode, and it's got I, you know, windows of, of internet pages of researches and articles articles and reviews. There's so much information sometimes that it becomes hard to even process, hard to manage. What we have to do is we have to kind of dig through all of that to focus in. And in our day and age, it, the more we focus on things, the more we, they become greater in our lives, the more clear and apparent they are in our lives. But what might happen as, as we progress 
as we age, as life goes through its experiences, anybody been through some of those life experiences? As we go through life experiences, our focus might become misaligned to what God has for us. We start looking or we start thinking on or we start directing our attention on certain aspects in life that God says, hey, listen, I don't want you to draw your attention there. So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about a focus realignment. You see, a while back, I really got a, a, a neat object lesson from the Holy Spirit. I had a phobia. Has anybody ever heard of phobias before? Or like, like, like arachnophobia and, and claustrophobia. You know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now listen, I got to make sure that we understand the difference between what a phobia and a general discomfort is, okay? So, so a phobia is an irrational fear of something. Irrational. It doesn't make sense. You can't even describe it. You're just freaked out by it, okay? There's a couple things that Pastor Luke has, uh, uh, not, I, I don't proclaim them, but needles, okay? I go to the doctor's office and they're like, it's time for a shot. You see me do the heebie-jeebie. <laughs> no, don't touch me with that. But a phobia, see that's general discomfort. A phobia is something, you can't describe it. Okay, so I may have a general discomfort with snakes. Anybody ever seen a snake? I, I went fishing yesterday in, in our local mountains and I was sitting on the side of a river. And a, no, tr here's Pastor Jim, ready, ready for this? True story. All right. <laughs> sitting on the side of the river and I look over and there's this darn snake snapping at me. He's trying to bite me. I'm not even kidding right now. All right, Pastor Luke made, I made the biggest, girl, thank, thank the Lord, I was in the wilderness by myself, okay? Because I made the biggest girl scream, I must have jumped like 45 feet, threw my fishing pole down, and, you know, did the, have you ever done the spider dance or anything like that? <laughs> right? Oh man, I'll tell you. That's, that, that's a general discomfort. A phobia is something I can't even explain. It, okay? it just, you're freaked out by it. You can't. I had one. And the Holy Spirit really used it as an object lesson for me. It was something that started to prohibit me from doing the things that I wanted to do, from doing the things that I really liked doing. I really enjoyed being on the outside. And this, and this particular phobia really, really stopped. I couldn't explain it. It was irrational. And it just came on me. I, I wasn't this way all my life. And all of a sudden it happened, and the Holy Spirit began to minister and began to speak to me as I was studying and thinking about what is going on with me in this. And the Holy Spirit began to say, the phobia or this irrational fear that you can't even describe or explain is from a process throughout your life of misaligned focus. You have been looking at things and you have been seeing things in the wrong light. You have been looking at the, you have been asking the wrong questions. You have been thinking the wrong thoughts in your mind. And because of that, it built up to a place now. You can't describe it. There's no rational emotion attached to it. All you know is that you can't do what this phobia is. Now you're like, Pastor Luke, what's this phobia? I'll get there. All right, I'll tell you. But the Holy Spirit began to show me that my focus was misaligned. So I began to think about, okay, what is the things that we naturally focus on? What are some things that we naturally focus on? Now, we could have spent all night just listing things. Now, we're not going to preach. Well, I'm going to preach on these. or I'm going to teach on these. But we're going to just kind of look at some four things that the Holy Spirit gave me in my own life regarding this phobia, regarding, regarding my own personal walk with God. Some things that we naturally, as humans, tend to focus on, tend to look at. All right? You guys with me today? Number one, well, you don't have to really write number one, number twos, or whatever like that, but one of the, some of the things that we focus on is we focus on the what ifs. The what ifs. Has anybody, anybody ever been a what if person? Is there any, any you, listen, it's okay. You can admit it. Remember the Bible says judge and let's not, you be judged, so, you know, let's not judge. I'm a what if person, which means I focus on what ifs all day long. My wife, she makes fun of me because while we're driving in the car on the freeway, she'll see my lips moving. And then all of a sudden, I'll, be, I'll start pointing. And she's just sitting there like in the, in the passenger seat looking at me, like watching, waiting for me to realize that I'm like going over something in my head. And then she's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm going over scenarios. Well, well okay, if I'm going to do this, what if they say that? What if they do this? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this? What if this? What if? And I go through what ifs all day long. We focus on the what ifs. All right? Second, well, some of the second things that we focus on. We focus on problems. Oh, my Lord. We focus on our problems. 
We look into them. Now, our problems might be issues. They might be speed bumps in life. They might be things that were handed to us, or you might say that were dealt to us through the process of life. Listen, our problems might be sin. We focus on them. We look at them. These are my vices. I can't get rid of them. I can't stop them. I, no matter what I do, it seems to come back. I throw it out, and it comes back, like we talked about tonight. Depression. We keep thinking about it over and over and over and over. We naturally have a tendency to focus on these. Have you ever heard the, the term, misery loves company? Yeah. Have you ever been around a person that just loves to talk about their problems? Have you ever been around somebody that has to one-up you with their problems? <laughs> yeah, man, how you feeling? You know, man, I, I got a little sinuses and, you know, my throat. Oh, oh, my, oh my goodness. You should have seen. Yesterday, I was like, it's like, man. Just, just let me be in my little own miserable company right now, okay? We focus on our problems. It's just natural human tendency. Some of the things that we focus on. Hey, listen, this is a big one. We focus on, on others. I'm sorry, we focus on ourselves. Let's do that one first. We focus on ourselves. And it's human nat nature for us to have selfish desires. I come from a family, praise God, that I don't have to live in generational curses. But I come from a family, not on Pastor Jim's side, that, that puts a great and a tremendous value on things. Have you ever been around somebody that put, puts a tremendous value on things? Does anybody, you know what I'm talking about? We have a name for them. It's not a name that we who put tremendous value on things like to hear, but we call them hoarders. My wife. Her grandfather took them two years to clean his house after he passed because he had a tremendous value on things. So what happens is we begin to see possession. We begin to see value. And it might be worthless to somebody else, but to me, to myself, hey, don't touch that. Don't mess with that. Don't move that. I've got, pl uh, that, they, we always say this, I got plans for that. <laughs> My wife, as I was running the message through, Today She was like, you know, well, this one doesn't really apply to me. You know, I'm a mom. Pretty much, it seems like my, my eternal blessing in life is to serve everybody else but myself. I said, okay. I was thinking about it, and the Lord spoke to me. The last one is our, our others. We focus on others. What are they doing? What are they saying? Now, this is big for us in our day and age. Oh my goodness, we've got that little thing on, on the internet. It's blue and white. It's got pictures all over the place. And it's like the gossip column of the world. We call it Facebook, right? You know. You know, you know. You know why we focus on it? Because you go on Facebook, you don't care. You just want to read. You just got to know what everybody else is doing. My wife, we were laughing about it today. I gave up Facebook. I go on every once in a blue moon, but really I gave it up. I gave up Facebook. You know what happened? I started reading the news every day. I don't even read the news. She's like, you're really bad with the news. It's like, I got to know what others are doing. I got to know. What are they saying? What are they thinking? And as I was thinking about my wife, what happens is sometimes we can think about others to the point where it becomes selfishness again because we're so worried about what they're thinking of us. We're so worried about how they view us or what they're saying about us that we become insecure in our own self. And so then our thinks, our thoughts may not tend towards selfish possessions, but they're immersed in our own life, our own selfish life as we go. So these are some things that we focus on. It's just natural human tendency for us to focus on these things. And as I was thinking about this and as the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, the thought came is that the time spent thinking on the what ifs, the time spent thinking on, on the problems, the time spent thinking about myself, Ugh. the time spent thinking about others and worrying about others is wasted time. I was thinking about this and the Holy Spirit was speaking to me and he says, man, how many times have you gone over what if scenarios? How many times have you planned for every area, for every aspect of a certain scenario, only for it to play out or pan out completely different than you ever anticipated? And you see, the time spent worrying, the time spent thinking about these things, focusing on these things is time for you and I that is wasted. And for us, the only thing that is so valuable, you see gold fluctuates in price, dollar bill goes up and it goes down. Time is the most valuable thing in the world. Why? Because it's something that we will never get back. 
And if we waste our time misaligned or un, in, 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 in a life of blur, not looking at what God has for us, then we're, we find ourselves in a position as we grow older in life through life's experiences, whether you're young or whether you're old. Through life's experiences, you realize that it becomes difficult to change your ways, your habits, because you become rooted in these things. And it's crucial for us to continually align our lives according to God's word and his will. Are you with me today? So I'm going to say a statement. What must, what must, listen, it's not an option. It's not a recommendation. It's not a Reader's Digest suggestion. What must we focus on? Well, there's only one point for that one. It's God. I'm not even going to put a number on that one. It's not, that's not even point number one. You see, that's the underlying statement of everything else in our lives is God. We must focus on God first and foremost. I remember I was talking in the young adults uh, 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 about a month ago. We were talking about love. And one of the statements I had talked about with love is that we've got to love God more than anybody, anything else. And I remember it kind of got back to me. You know, as a pastor, they, 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 they say that the shepherd knows what goes on about the flock. So, you know, it kind of trickled back to me. And people were talking after the service. Man, Pastor Luke, he, he, he was jacked up in that statement. That's not true. I mean, if you've got kids, you've got to love your kids, man. You've got to love your wife. You've got to focus on, on your family. That's important. But you see, above all of that, above and beyond everything, listen, it's, it's hard. The Word of God, if you let it long enough, if you, if you live in it long enough, will rub you eventually the wrong way somewhere. And chances are, this statement, this little section, is a big brunt of that. Is that we have got to love God above all else, beyond all else. As a matter of fact, Jesus says in the book of Luke that our love for God in comparison should make everything else look like hatred. We love God so much that everything else it pales in comparison. So what must we focus on? God. That's the obvious. I don't, I don't want to spend any more time on that. We have got to focus on God. Everything revolves around that. You know, that the, the, the survivalists, they say that the human body can spend three days or live three days without water. So water is priority for our lives. But do you realize that you and I could not spend one vapor second on this earth alone on our, by ourselves without God? It is God that holds the entire universe in balance. So water may be essential to our survival, but God is even more so essential. Therefore, God is deserving and worthy of our utmost focus. That's why Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 33, we all know that one. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Talking about the worries of life. What shall we eat? What shall we wear? What shall we do? Don't worry about those things first and foremost. Align your focus. Align your perspective with God. Are you with me today? Praise God. So today, that was what we must focus on. Now let's shift gears to what you and I need to focus on. What we need to focus on. This is that realignment. Not changing, realigning, putting things back into place that we have knocked out through the life experiences. What we need to focus on, number one today, is goodness. We need to focus on goodness. You see, for those of you in this place that are like Pastor Luke, that are like me, I'm a what ifer. All right, man, I tell you, I'm a what ifer all day long. What if, what if, what if, at any given time in my car, there's like a sweater, a jacket, an emergency blanket, water. I mean, what if, what if, what if, it's like 95 degrees outside. I got a rain jacket. Why? What if? <laughs> Have you ever noticed whether you're a what if or not? Okay. Not a whatever or not. That's the talk to the hand thing. A what if. Have you ever noticed the things that make you anxious? The more you think about the things that make you anxious, the more anxious you become. Anybody ever noticed that before? See, so when we focus on that which makes us anxious, when we focus on that which we don't know, the uncertain, all it does is, is it becomes greater in our lives and we become more anxious and we become more anxious and we become more anxious and then we become undone in our lives and we're trying to figure out, God, where are you in this maze? I'm falling apart. And simply God said, hey, listen, stop looking at all the things that are making you anxious. Stop it. That's what the Bible says. Be anxious for nothing, Paul says. I'm not even going to that verse. 
I remember there was a time I was in the young adult's uh, service. I was after service and I was talking to a young adult. And they were talking to me. They said, Pastor Luke, man, I just, I'm having a hard time with this Christian thing. I'm having a hard, hard time living this life. Well, and I said, well, what's going on? Well, you know, I'm, I'm struggling in this and I'm struggling in that area. And as we were talking, we started just, I started just talking the word, giving them the scripture because I have nothing to say. So I just started talking. The they said, well, 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 but yeah, oh, that's great. But what if this? Okay, and so I give them a scripture for that. Okay, okay, okay. But what about this? What if, what if this happens? Okay, we'll give them a scripture. What if this? And I started to notice the pattern in this conversation. They were just what ifing me. What if? What if? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can continue on because this might happen. I don't know if I can really stay strong with God because what if this happens? Or what if this? Or what if my family says? Or what if? And finally, I stopped the conversation. I said, stop. Stop. You're focusing on the wrong things. You're focusing on everything that might happen. You might walk out of this place right now. What if you die in a car accident? Did you think about that? And they were like, no. <laughs> what if the world ends? What if there's an earthquake? What if the building falls? What if the moon comes out of this? What if, what if, what? You're focusing on the wrong things. Those are things and questions we may never have answered. So we got to stop spending our time focusing on the what ifs. You see, you can worry about what ifs until you're blue in the face. And do you know what you will get out of that? A blue face. That's all you will get. We cannot worry about the things. We have to worry and focus on God's goodness on the goodness. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number eight. Go with me. Philippians 4, 8. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number eight. Oh man, what, a, what an awesome, what an awesome book Paul's writing here. I love this. I mean, this is a book that literally... You just feel like you can do anything when you, when, you're, when you read through Philippians. Just need to just take a good read. Read through Philippians, the, the, the book of Philippians. I'll tell you, it's just amazing. Philippians in the fourth chapter. Paul, as he's exhorting the church in Philippi, verse number eight, he says, Finally, brethren, finally, brethren, listen. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue in there, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these. Set your mind on these. Focus on these. Not the things that are going to tear you down. Not the things that are going to get you nowhere in life. Not the things that are going to break you apart and build your anxiety. Focus on what is good in life. You with me today? Now, I talked about phobia. I never gave it to you, so now I will give it to you. It's confessional time. My phobia, and I'm going to say this past tense because I believe the Holy Spirit has gotten me through this. My irrational fear was heights. Some of you are like, hey, amen, hallelujah, praise God, I'm right there with you. Some of the men are like that. They just say that so they don't have to put Christmas lights up on the roof. I remember vividly, vividly, the first time I encountered what people who are afraid of heights call vertigo. Has anybody ever had vertigo before? Anybody ever felt that where all of a sudden the world just starts spinning? There is no north, south, east, west. You are just a spin. Now, some of you are like, Pastor Luke, I've had that before. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about phobia, okay? I'm not talking about the stuff you were smoking. <laughs> I'm talking about true, real. I remember it vividly. We were hiking. I was hiking with some friends here at the church. We decided one of these days we were going to climb up to the top of the mountain. The hike was rather mellow as far as heights go. Got up to the mountain. It was great. Signer. Oh, there was no register on that one. We got up took our pictures at the little plaque at the very top of the mountain. It was cool. We said, all right, we're going to make a loop. We're going to go down this other way. So we got down this other way. We turned a corner, and there was a spot on the trail. Now, listen, I didn't name it, okay? So don't, don't judge me for the name. But there was a spot on the trail. They call it the devil's backbone. I had heard about it. This was the very first time I encountered vertigo because as I was walking, we walked on the ridge line of the mountain and both sides of the mountain went away. The trail was about six feet wide. It was about 400 foot cliff on one side and it was about a 70 degree loose rock bowl for about a thousand feet of elevation on the other side. I've got a picture of it. Devil's backbone. There it is. That doesn't look that intimidating. I don't know if for those of you who are impeccable with your vision, there's a person in that picture. That person's about six feet tall, so the trail's only about three feet tall. The very first time in my life I encountered vertigo from the fear of heights was right there in the middle of that trail, when all of a sudden my world stopped. My world started spinning. I couldn't move. I literally could not pick one foot up and move it in front of the other. And I had another friend. He was afraid of heights too, but he wasn't freaking out like I was. 
And all of a sudden, I recounted, I recalled back to when I was a kid. My mama taught me, 2 Timothy 1.7, For I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And I remember I was sitting there on the trail. It was about as wide as a step. And I started praying in tongues, loud. And everybody's looking at me, what is this guy doing? <laughs> and I started speaking, I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power. And one foot went in front of the other. One or the other. You know what? I made it through there. What's great, it's wonderful. The fear was still there. I was still terrified. My palms were sweaty. I was like, I ain't ever going on that trail ever again. Boom, get my feet on solid ground. But I remember as I was doing that, the Holy Spirit, as I, I walked by, it just disturbed me. It bugged me. The Holy Spirit said, You're not afraid of heights, you're afraid of falling. And I started thinking about it. Huh, it's not the heights. I started analyzing it. All right, truly, if, if I fell, my irrational logic would say, oh my goodness, I, I'm going to walk, and all of a sudden I haven't tripped all day long, but I'm going to walk, and I'm going I'm to catch my heel, and I'm going to go head first off a cliff and just never see ground again, fall into an eternal black hole. That's my thought. That's my irrational logic. When reality is, the, the trail's wide enough. If I fall, what's really going to happen? For, first of all, I'm carrying forward momentum, so if anybody knows anything about physics... I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall forward, not off. I, I mean, you just never trip and fall like off to your side. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit began to say, listen, man, you're focusing on the wrong things. And as I began, I started to look at that. I started to realize that if I stop focusing on what if, what if, what if I fall? What, what, if, what if I trip on a rock? My legs are tired. What happens if I stop focusing on that and say, you know what? There's a trail. I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that step. I'm going to take that step. Okay, now what do I focus on? I'm going to focus on that step. All right, now what? I'm going to focus on that step. You know what now I'm going to do? I'm going to stop and I'm going to stare my fear in the face and I'm going to look at the view because that's what you came up here for. And I begin to realize and I begin to focus on why I was there, what my goal was in mind. Guess what? My mind became preoccupied with the things that I was set out to do and the fear of falling was in the background. It's the same thing for you and I in our lives. If we focus on the wrong things, they're going to become big in our lives. The anxiety is going to get there. It's only going to get greater. All we can do is focus on what's good, what's pure, what's noble, what's holy, what's just. Are you with me today? The Bible says in Romans that we've got to renew our mind, which means we have got to continually change our thinking. Why? Because it's going to want to go back to the what ifs. It's going to want to go back to the anxieties. It's going to want to go back to the, to the things that drag us down. But when we realign our focus, it allows us to do something that we never thought we could do through the will of God. And this last year, I stared, 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 thank you. I stared my fear in the face, and I climbed to the top of Mount Whitney, the tallest mountain in the continental United States. And I was sharing with one of our interns. We had this thing called the trust fall where everybody stood on the wall and they fell back and the interns all caught that one person. I mean, it was scary. And I shared with them, there was this one intern that she was just having a hard time, she couldn't do it. And I said, listen, I, I opened up, nobody knew it. I said, here's the deal. In two weeks, I'm going to the top of this mountain. Here's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it for the accolades. I'm not doing it to say I did it. I'm doing it because there are two spots on that trail that they call the windows. And the windows are, the trail is three feet wide and it's not 400 feet like I talked about on the devil's backbone. It's 2,000 feet on one side, and it's 1,000 feet on the other side. And I said, I'm doing it because I'm not going to let fear control me anymore. Like the Apostle Paul said, I will not be brought under the power of any. And I began to realize that my fear of tripping had no power over me because I would focus on what God had for me because no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And here's a picture of us at the window. Put the window picture up. That's our group. You can see behind me. I'm the one in the black all the way on the right-hand side. There ain't nothing there. That is a sheer drop, 2,000 feet. That's about 13,600 feet. The, the, the drop lands at about 11,600 feet. And you can feel the wind blowing. On the other side, it's about a 1,000-foot drop. You know, I say, Pastor Luke, you're nuts. You're crazy. But you know what? I focused on the things that, the, that God had told me to focus on. Think about the price. Think about getting up to the top of that mountain or writing your name in the register that goes into the Smithsonian Institute. Think about the hike. Think about the journey. Think about the guys that you're with. Think about the encouragement that's going on. And don't think about your, your fear to trip. And guess what? I made it through that entire journey, 22 miles, brown trip, without tripping once. Why? Because I'm not focusing on it. We can get through life when we stop focusing on what tries to drag us down. Are you with me today? 
excuse me. What we need to focus on, number two, solutions. Remember I talked about in the natural we like to focus on our problems? Oh man, complaining is so much fun. You know why? Because you don't ever have to come up with a solution. You just get to gripe about how the world is so... You know the best part is? I love to complain at Disneyland. <laughs> Pastor Dan and I were talking about this. It's manufactured happiness, man. You don't remember the good moments. Why? Because everything's supposed to be good. You only remember the bad ones. You remember when you got there and they put you in the farthest parking spot in the, in the stinking resort. You can't figure out why because you drove through all the other ones and they're empty. You, you try to figure out why they got everything closed. Oh, they got four lines going and they only got one. There's one person skipping every... You know, you've been there before too. We like to complain. Well, they should do it like this. If I was running it, I'd do it like that. <laughs> Complaining is easy because we don't ever have to come up with a solution. But you see, we should stop focusing on the problem and start looking at the solution. Yes. That's the issue. That's the realignment. When you look, it's like anxiety. When we look at the problems, guess what? They get bigger, right? But when we begin to focus on the issue or on the solution, guess what happens? The problem gets smaller, what you put your eyes on, what you put your focus and your attention on will become greatest in your life. And when you focus on your problems, oh, I got problems, they will get big. But the solution is right around the corner. We got to stop focusing not on the what ifs, but the right nows. That's our problems. They get everything. When they get, when they get bigger, everything gets smaller and we become slaves. Stop giving them the attention. Stop feeding your problems. You're there in Philippians. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews in the 12th chapter. Hebrews in the 12th chapter. Such a cool verse. Man, the Holy Spirit just popped this out of me today. Hebrews the 12th chapter, verse number 1. Kind of familiar verse for us. Hebrews 12, chapter 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I love this. Verse number two. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Now, going back to verse number one, this is what jumped out at me today. I always accounted this verse as, let us set aside, get rid of the sin in your life. Put it away. This is a verse about sin. But do you see it says, let us, go back to verse number one, A. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. See, this is problems. This is things that drag you down. This is things in your life. It may just be the things that you were handed to in life. It might just be experiences that we go through in life that are beyond our control. Not just the sin that we have brought into our life, but the weight and the sin. Get rid of it. Why? Stop focusing on it. Praise God. There's verse number two that says, looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Which means stop looking at your problems. Stop looking at the weight that might be around your ankles and start looking at the solution. Jesus Christ, the one that will get you through. The Bible says the author and the finisher of our faith. <clears throat> Praise God. I remember when I was hiking one time with Stacy, I was out walking. All of a sudden, my left hip locked. I'm, I'm young, all right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I know some of you guys are like, dude, you're a kid. I know. My hip should not do what it did. I was out in the middle of just Riverside. We were at this really cool little park, and my hip stopped. I couldn't bend it. I couldn't move it. I couldn't bend over. I couldn't lift it. It stopped. We had to stand there, and she had to try to help me rub it out. And it wasn't a Charlie horse. It was internal. So I went to the doctor. The doctor looked at my hip. They put me on a treadmill, and they watched the way I walk. And the doctor said, oh, man, you got to go to physical therapy right now. I'm thinking, man, I just... He says, it's your right hip. And I, no, 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 doctor, doctor, doctor. It's my left hip. My left hip's the one that locked. No, it's your right hip's the problem. No, oh, you don't understand. Doctor, it's my, my, my left hip. It's the one that locked up, doc. So I go to physical therapy three months, two times a week. I'm in physical therapy. They tell me that I've got this thing called femoral acetabular impingement. It's bone rubbing on bone on my right hip. The cartilage is kind of wearing out, or it's, there's a spur that's coming around that, that ball joint. And what that does is that causes me to favor my hip. They saw this on the treadmill. The way I would run, I'd swing my right hip out and my left hip would be kind of this little like gimp. And what happened is, is because of that, the muscles here got stronger than the muscles here. And that's why this hip locked up. That's why I had sciatic pains in the back because my hips were all tweaked. Three months of physical therapy and they told me, listen, we need you to stop hiking. We need you to stop biking. 
We need you to stop. I was playing hockey, rec hockey at the time. We need you to stop playing hockey. We need you to stop doing everything that you like to do and just sit on the couch and be a bum. <laughs> My problem. Everything that I like to do, they told me I couldn't do it anymore because of this. So I could focus on the problem. I could say, man, that stinks. Well, I'll live the good old days. I'll talk about the glory days and I'll reminisce. I could start focusing on the problem where I can say, you know what? I could start getting on there, start talking to the doctor, start talking to the physical therapist. What can I do? What kind of stretches? What kind of exercises can I do to help better my situation? And start doing those. Before the hikes, I would get down on the ground. Everybody would be looking at me all weird. And I'd have my legs up behind my head and I'd be tweaking off to the side. And I'd have like a little branch in between my legs, doing all these weird stretches. But you see, what happened is I started focusing on the solution. The solution was to try to better myself, to better my body so that this didn't become something that would pull me down. And because of that, I was able to climb to the top of the highest mountain in the 48 states, 22 miles round trips, over a mile of elevation gain. It stunk as a hike. And there's a picture of us on the top of the mountain. Me and five guys, three of those are guys from the church, from the young adults ministry, man. It was like the, the highlight of our life. You see, if I would have focused on the problem, I would have never sat there at the plaque of that mountain by the Smithsonian Institute. I would have never sat there. If we focus on the problems in our lives, whether they be the sin in our lives, whether they be the issues, whether they be things that drag us down, we will never get to where God has for us. We can only focus on the solution, that is Jesus Christ. For those of you, Pastor Dan, here was where that picture came. For those of you that are, are, get a little bit heebie-jeebies, any hype people in the house? Any of you say, man, I'm not, okay. This picture's for you, the next one. That was where I sat and made a phone call to my wife. That is at 14,500 feet. I sat there and called my wife. My feet were on that bottom rock. And I leaned over the edge and put my camera. The, where that lake is, that's straight down. And that is 3,000 feet. You see, we can look at fear in the face and say, uh-uh. You're not going to get there anymore. Not going to get there anymore. Fear, you don't have anything. Problems, you don't have any issue on me. Why? Because I'm going to focus on what God says. I'm going to say about my life what God says. It might be your children might be your problem. Your work might be your problem. Your money might be your problem. Your life might be your problem. Your, your emotions might be your problem. But you're going to say, you know what? I'm not going to focus on the things that drag me down. I'm going to put those things behind. Because I'm looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And I'm going to stand on the top of the mountain that God has called me to stand on. And nothing is going to get in my way. You tell that punk devil to go back to the fiery hell pit he came from. Now you're saying, hallelujah, Pastor Luke, you said my problems were money. Listen, remember, the Bible says what you sow, you reap. Don't be thinking Jesus is going to bail you out because you got in over your head in debt. He's going to give you the strength and the ability to do, to endure through and give you the smarts to get out of that. Praise God. Let's not be so naive in our lives. But remember that Jesus is the answer. He is the solution. Are you with me today? I'm going so late, I'm going to just wrap these two up real quick. Two things that we need, last things we need to focus on. Number three, we need to focus on ourselves. Wait, what? What? what, what? You said we focus on ourselves. Remember I said the message is called focus realignment, right? Not change. We got to realign. So what we do is we focus on ourselves materialistically, physically. Have you ever noticed that when you go to the gym? Have you ever noticed that gyms have mirrors? They never notice that. They always have a mirror at the gym. Wherever there's weights, there's a gym. And I didn't know why until I lived with this one guy. I'm not even going to call him out by name. But he was one of my college roommates, man. And he would go work out. He would be in his room and he would do push-ups. And he's the, the skinniest little, little twig of a guy. I mean, I'm six foot one, 200 pounds. All right, and this guy is like nothing. He was my roommate. And he would just be sitting there working out. And then he would, as, soon, as soon as the workout's done, he would run to the bathroom and look at himself. Dude, you didn't get any buffer doing 10 push -ups. No, man, no, man, your muscles swell. Your muscles swell. That's why they have me. Why we like ourselves. But see, we need to stop focusing on ourselves on the outside, on the material, on the selfish desires. But we do need to start focusing on ourselves spiritually. Because otherwise we suffer what we call burnout or shipwreck. Because we start focusing so much on everything else that we don't give time to build ourselves. We don't give time to build ourselves up. We need to realign and focus ourselves spiritually. 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. I'll just put it on the overhead because we're running out of time. We have ran out of time. Paul the Apostle says, don't you know those who run a race all run, but one receives a prize? He says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. You're going to have to run like you've never ran before. And he's speaking. He's giving a physical example to a spiritual principle. 
He's using this like I'm using the mountain for you. He's using this race for you and I spiritually. Run in your spiritual life so that you will obtain a prize. And he goes on to say, verse number 25, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do not obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable. Look with it. Verse number 26. Therefore I run thus. This is how I run. I don't run with uncertainty. I know where I'm going. I know the track. Thus I fight. This is how I fight my spiritual battles. Not as somebody who's boxing the air with no opposition. What does he say? Verse number 27. He's building it up. He says, I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. He says, I'm going through resistance training in my life. I am focusing on myself spiritually to build myself up so that when the battles of life come, I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly how to fight. I know exactly because I've been there before. We have got to do this. We understand that. An unfit body will be unprepared for the task ahead. When I set out to climb Mount Whitney, to hike Mount Whitney, it was a year ago I started training. I weighed 210 pounds. All right, I, thought, you know, I, got some, I, I was bulking up, as they say. Bulking up. All right, I've lost 40 pounds to prepare for that. Why? Because I knew that at my present situation, at my present condition, I wasn't going to make it. So what did I do? I started subjecting, putting myself under discipline. I started saying, all right, you're going to do this. You're going to start walking. You're going to start, you're going to start swimming, because that's what they told me to do with my hips. To do that, I, I gave myself, aside from a healthy lifestyle, we have got to put ourselves spiritually into subjection, which means we have to place time. You have to make a priority for you and I in our lives. We have got to set time aside to build ourselves up spiritually so that we can achieve the task at hand. Are you with me today? Are you still here? Are you all right with me? I know I'm talking so long. For me, it was cookies. I'm not even kidding, man. I lost 40 pounds by not eating any more cookies. You just got to put yourself in subjection. Start focusing. Give yourself a spiritual goal. Start reading the Word of God every day, whatever it might be. Amen. Luke, the 13th chapter, Jesus says, Strive to enter. Strive. Strive. What does that mean? What does that mean? That means work at it. Push at it. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. Yes. It's going to take work in our lives, church. And we've got to work for it. Are you with me today? All right, last one. We'll move on. Last one. You know what it's coming because we're talking about realignment. Last one. Focus on others. See, no longer should you and I focus on what they think about, what they say about. What, you know, there used to be time I was so convicted. I would spend, and I'm not even a fashion guy, I would spend so much time in the closet. I was like a diva before I'd preach. <laughs> before I'd come up here, Pastor Luke was sitting in the closet, and I'd be trying on every outfit. And I'm not that kind of a guy. Pastor Dan can attest, I am not an outfit guy. But there was one time when Pastor Dan got a letter for some pants that he wore. I'm calling you out, man. All right. And I got so concerned about what everybody else would think. Oh, well, this, 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 and this, 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 this you know, I, I, can't, I can't wear that. I can't, this doesn't match. Does this go together right? You know, and I would think about it. I would try it. And the Lord said, you're spending more time on clothes than you are preparing for the message. We got a problem here. We got to stop focusing on what everybody else thinks about us. When you walk out of the house, it doesn't matter what people think about you. You know why? Here's the reality. Christianity from, from its inception has always been counterculture. It's never the popular vote. There was an article a year ago, Christianity's on the decline. It's no longer the popular choice in America. Hello, it's never been that way in the world. That's why Jesus was nailed to a cross. Was an elected president, which means we've got to stop focusing on what people care about us or what people say about us. Galatians in the fifth chapter, Paul the Apostle talking to the church, he says, man, you guys ran well. You did well. Who hindered you? Who stopped you? What pulled you back? You were listening to the wrong voice. He goes on to say, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Stop listening to the voices on the outside. Stop listening to the critics. If Jesus would have listened to the critics, what would he have accomplished? The Pharisee said, why does your master hang out with the tax collectors and the sinners? Jesus says, because the people who are healthy don't need a doctor. Stop worrying what the world says about you. Stop worrying about what they think about you, what they say about you at work. He's the weird one. He's the noisy one. Start thinking about others in a different light. Not just what they think about you. Now start thinking about how you can do something for them. 
What can I do to bless you? What can I do to shine God's light for you? What can I do to show you how much God loves you? My favorite verse. Oh my goodness, my favorite verse. Jesus says to his disciples, because I like fishing. Matthew in the fourth chapter says, hey, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You come into me, you come to Jesus, you get him in your life, you start focusing on the things that God has for you. Stop worrying about the what ifs and start worrying about goodness. Stop focusing on goodness. Stop worrying about your problems and start focusing on the solution. Start focusing on, on yourself spiritually and building yourself. And guess what? Naturally, it will become a, a river of flowing life that people will look at you and say, man, what is it that you have? You don't even have to try. All you have to do is start worrying or start thinking. You don't have to worry about anything. You start thinking about focusing on what you can do for the kingdom of God for others. It's not just so that you and I can hold this together. This kingdom, all this great love that we have, it's so that we can give it away. We've got to realign our focus. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? God is good. I'll tell you what. If we start focusing and start looking at what God has and where God has, that's when life really begins. Amen? Let me ask you a really important question. I want you to examine your heart from, for just a moment. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a very simple question, a very simple answer. If you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? You see, we talked about realigning our focus or our perspective to looking at the right way. You see, what happened in, throughout the course of centuries, throughout the course of society is that we've become misaligned with the things of God. And when we answer that question in our heart and in our minds, we think, oh yeah, I'm going to go to heaven. We answer that based on a misaligned focus or a misaligned perspective of the things of God. So now all of a sudden we think in our head, well, because I'm a good person, because I don't cheat on my taxes, or because I, uh, I don't drive too fast on the freeway, or I've never robbed the 7-Eleven, because of that, I'm a, good I'm a good person. People go to heaven who are good. We think because of a misaligned perspective, well, because I'm sitting in church today, I heard the pastor speak, I, I, I raised my hands or I gave something in the offering bucket as it went by that, that God honors that and I'm going to get into heaven. We think because of a misaligned perspective that because my parents told me I was a Christian, because I've got a cross or St. Christopher around my neck, because I've got a tattoo somewhere in my body that says Jesus or a scripture reference. We think out of a misaligned perspective that because I want to, because I hope so, because I really believe so that I'm going to go to heaven, we think we're going to get there. But the truth is, is that we're all basing those thoughts out of misaligned perspectives with the kingdom of God. You see, you can't get to heaven on your own devices. You can't get to heaven because you want to, because you wish so. You're not going to get to heaven because you come to church or because your parents told you you were a Christian. You're not going to get into heaven because you call yourself a Christian. Or because you never robbed the 7-Eleven or because you volunteer in the children's ministry or because you go to church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to heaven because of those things. You see, the only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way we can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus Christ, not any other way. It's not about how good we are, not about how, how, how positive our thoughts are. It's about aligning our perspective, our lives with the Word of God. And God says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means no matter how hard we try, we'll never be good enough to get into heaven. Because God's standard is perfection, and we've, we've missed out on that already. But you see, there's a way, and the way is Jesus Christ. Jesus says that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through Him. Which means you can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee or author's way or TV show's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way, and He says it's Jesus Christ. Jesus, as He was speaking in the book of John in the third chapter, He's talking to a religious leader, a man by the name of Nicodemus. The Bible says that Nicodemus was a leader, a Pharisee, of the Pharisees and a leader of the Jews. What that means is Nicodemus was a highly educated man. Nicodemus had memorized the scripture. Nicodemus taught in the synagogues. Nicodemus gave to the poor, did all the right things, said all the right things, wore all the right clothes. People said good things about him. And you would think that as Jesus is discussing the subject of heaven and eternal life with a man by the name of Nicodemus, Jesus would say to him, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward. But Jesus says to Nicodemus these words, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, our, our culture, our society, sitcoms and movies have made a mockery out of that term. You think of weirdo, crazy, out-of-control Christianity. Oh, man, I'm not buying what you're selling. Listen, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. Here it is. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all-or-nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. The Bible says that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, know who Jesus is, yet they're not on their way to heaven. The Bible shows us that the devil knows the scriptures. He said it back to Jesus. 
yet he's not on his way to heaven. It's not about your carnal knowledge or your mental ascent of who God is. Listen, I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here tonight. It goes beyond that. It's all or nothing. It's all of your heart. It's all of your life. The book of Revelation, book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ, listen, he's speaking to the church, people like you and I, not to somebody on the street, people like you and I. He says, I'm going to come back. And when I come back, Jesus says, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. It's a shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will be counted as waste, as rejection from the kingdom of God. Rejected and ejected. What does lukewarm mean? Let's define that. Lukewarm is simply put, just a little bit up, a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out. Occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Half in, half out, riding the fence. Listen, 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 listen. Come on, let's reason together. If you were in any relationship, whether it be romantic, whether you're married, whether you have friends, whether you're in a business relationship, whatever it might be, any relationship you ever encountered, if you went to somebody and said, listen, man, I'm only going to be in on this half the week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, the rest of the time I'm doing my own thing. You know full well that that relationship would never grow, would never succeed. Yet we think that we can go to God and say, God, I'll love you on Sundays, and that's good enough. When God says, I want all of your heart, I want all of your life. Today, it's your decision. You see, God's not in, in heaven with a two-by-four waiting to smack you on the head when you do something wrong. You've got to understand. God's not a manipulator or a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And you see, the Holy Spirit tells us, the Bible says that he's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way and he's going to ask for you to invite him. And it's your choice, your decision today to surrender all of your heart, all of your life to God and allow him to be the one in control so that you can realign your perspective from the things that you once were to now the things that God says you are. And you can live life according to the word of God, not according to the way of the world. Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it more abundantly today. It's your free will choice. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. Jesus says this. He says, if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he'll deny you. So today, all across this auditorium, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, three. Hit my hand on my Bible, just like that. And when I smack my hand on my Bible, bang, just like that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be bold. I want to ask you to be bold today. And in just a moment, if you want to give him your heart, you want to give him your life, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is just saying, hey, I acknowledge today I want to do this. I want to make sure today, I, I want to, uh, today, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give him all my life. I'll see your hand. I'm a man. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. Listen, don't let a moment of irrational feelings or emotions stop you from making the very best decision you'll ever make for the rest of your life. This is your choice. You wouldn't be embarrassed if you bought a really nice house or a really nice car. Don't be embarrassed because you're making the best decision any human being could ever make. To choose eternal life with God in heaven, leaving hell behind. You see, God's not in the business of condemning. God's not in the business of sending you to hell. God's in the business of redeeming. That's why he said, for God so loved the world, he gave Jesus. But God loved you so much, he gave you a free will choice, and it is your choice. He did everything he could in his power by giving his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ, to die for yours and my sin. And now it is our free will choice to accept or reject the gift of salvation. Today, don't, don't reject it. In just a moment, all across this auditorium, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. Whether you've done this before or you haven't, maybe you've never given him your heart, never given him your life. In just a moment, pop your hand up, I'll see it. Maybe you're not sure today. Maybe you walked in this place saying, man, you know what? I really just, I just need to solidify where I'm at with God. I need to stop playing games with God. Listen. God loves you enough right now to tell you, to speak to you in your heart, right now, in your life. The Bible says it's the goodness of God. Stop playing games. Stop messing around. This is your moment. This is your time. In just a moment, pop your hand up. Maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God, saying, hey, if that's you, in just a moment, pop your hand up. This is your moment. This is your time. The time of your salvation is right now. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. From the front to the back, whether you're in the foyer, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, online watching, or hearing the sound of my voice, wherever you're at, this is the moment of your salvation. Don't go another moment without making sure today, solidifying your position with God in heaven forever and ever and ever, leaving hell behind. It was never designed for you. Don't go there. Don't think that it's going to be a party. There ain't no parties in hell. The decision is totally yours. It's a free will choice. It's a gift for you today, but you've got to make the first step. So I'm going to count to three all across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, wherever you're at. This is your moment. This is your time. Get ready. Be bold. Make that profession of your faith. See it. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down, and then we'll change destinies together. We'll pray together in just a moment. Here we go. Get ready. All across this auditorium, this is your moment. This is your time. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place. One, two, three, four, five, six. I see you right there. Seven. I see you right there. 
Seven wise people, where are you at? Eight, I got you right over there. Eight wise people, anybody else? Nine, I got you back there. You got two hands up. Ten, I, I, you're pointing. I'm going to count you. You better watch where you're pointing. Ten wise people, anybody else in the place today? In the family rooms? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Anybody else in this place today? Ten wise people. Anybody else today? I want to give you that opportunity. Come on, this is your moment. This is your time. Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. You're saying, I wonder if this guy's ever going to shut up. Maybe it's time. Anybody else in this place today? Ten wise people. I'm going to conclude it right here. Well, praise God for ten wise people. Hallelujah. From the front to the back, wherever you're at, listen, you, you acknowledge. You say, I want to do this. Pastor Luke, that's what I said. You can say by raise, you can say by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, by, by believing in him, by asking him, by inviting him into your heart, into your life. Today we want to do that together. We want to change destinies together. It was important enough for you to make that first step. It's important enough for you now to follow through. So here's what I'm going to ask. Whether you are in the family rooms, the front row, the back row, wherever you're at, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get out of your seat, get out of the chair. In a moment, we're all going to stand together. And when we do, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get in the aisle and come meet me right here at the altar. We're going to change destinies together. We're going to go forward in your life for the rest of your life. So let's all stand. Please, nobody leave. If you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. If you brought somebody, say, hey, I'll come with you. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come meet me right here. Let's change destinies together. Come on. Come on. Come on, you come. Thanks for Come on, you can come. Come, it's not too late. If that's you, come on. Come on. Hey, congratulations. Awesome, guys. Listen. Hey, you're not going to a funeral. All right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. All right, you're going to be born again. All right, new creation, the Bible says. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving? This guy is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. Listen, nothing weird goes on. I am as weird as it gets. Okay, you made it through me. Praise God. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Okay, you're going to get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Okay. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some real free, uh, free literature, real easy reading. It's like 20 pages of just like third grade reading level. It's super easy, okay? And this helps you. You're going to walk out of this place and say, now what? We're going to point you in the right direction. The last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. Talked about mirrors at the gym. You know, you go to the gym, you see personal trainers. They, 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 they help you work out and make sure you're using all that equipment the right way so you don't waste your time. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody will meet with you right here at church. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for free. Sit with you for five simple weeks. Teach you some things about the Word of God. They'll give you a really cool Bible at the end of that process. And they'll help build you, encourage you, and strengthen you. Why? So you don't go back to the life that you came from. And you go forward in your relationship with God, realigning your focus with what God has for you. So if you go to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. Hallelujah. Yes! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.